there. It's good to see you here this morning. It's good to see you here. I think it's awesome to, always to be seen. You know what also is cool? Is our church family, our church staff, has put together a great fall with their ministry and helping people to come to Christ and also the, to meet people's needs. I'm excited about that. But I think our church this morning would like to know what the arts team might be doing for the Advent yes, season the arts this year. Team. Well, Norman and I have been putting together an original song for our Advent season. We're very excited about it. You should... Also be excited about it. So we uh, have a concert coming up for Zach Williams on December 2nd, don't wanna miss that. And Norman and I are specifically putting focus on each Sunday morning for Advent. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. And um, we are gonna finish our Advent season on Sunday morning, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is on Sunday, wild. Our 10.30 service that day will be led by Norman. Awesome. It'll be great. Then we have a 4 p.m. service that'll be led by me that's a candlelight service. Great. And then we're finishing our Advent season with bringing back the 11 p.m. candlelight service. And it'll be a wild time. We're really excited for you all to be there. All of this will happen in lieu of Christmas of the Cube. Christmas of the Cube will be replaced by all this really fun Advent activity. It's gonna be great. So you won't wanna miss it. Be there. It'll be fun. Love you guys. Norman loves you guys. Yes. And so do I. Okay. I have to follow that. That's awesome. Welcome to Council Road Baptist Church. We love that you're here this morning, either here in the room or watching online. Response card, if you have any prayer requests, any information you'd like to give us as a staff, we pray over those, we do, that, do what we need to with that information. If you're a guest with us, would you do us the honor of filling one of these out and letting us know as much information as you want us to have? And we will contact you, I promise. That's why we get these. Uh, so fill those out, put them in the buckets at the back. We'd love to pray for you and know what's going on in your life. As a call to worship this morning, I want to read from Philippians chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 5. It says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Heavenly Father, we proclaim Jesus the name that is above every name, the only name that can save us from who we are and what we are. Father, today as we proclaim the name of Jesus, I pray that you would receive it as an aroma pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
One day, we will see him face to face. I told the choir earlier, an orchestra, that um, there's a lot of people that I want to see in heaven that have gone on before, a lot of them, but none greater than seeing Jesus face to face. Can you imagine? Can you picture it? That's the realm we should live in every day, thinking about Him and seeing Him face to face. Would you stand as we sing some great hymns of faith this morning? Let's praise Him with our voices, with our bodies, and everything that we're doing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring. But I wholly lean on Jesus' name On a Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every High and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the bed. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, word at 
trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy, mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Thank you, congregation. You may be seated. As I look over the congregation this morning, um, I look at y'all and I realize that maybe we don't realize how many times we have prayed for one another. I think if you stop and just look across this way in this group, look across this way, you'll realize some people that you have prayed for. I know that in my life, many people have prayed for myself, my wife, our family, and I'm so grateful for that. But, but aren't you glad you're part of a congregation that believes in the power of prayer, praying to the God the Father and praying for one another? And I wouldn't want to be a part of a church that did not believe that. So, aren't you glad that somebody in your life has prayed for you? I know that I am. When my heart was so broken that I couldn't pray when love wasn't easy to see someone was there somebody cared somebody prayed for me Somebody went to the throne of heaven, somebody lifted my name, bringing me into his holy presence, saying what I could not say. Somebody showed me the face of his mercy when darkness was all. Somebody pleaded the blood of Jesus. Somebody prayed for me. When the future looked hopeless and I side of my dreams somebody near dried every tear somebody prayed for me somebody went to the throne of heaven somebody my name, bringing me into his holy presence, saying what I could not say. Somebody showed me the face of his mercy when darkness was all I could see. Somebody
Somebody pleaded the blood of Jesus. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody went to the throne of heaven. Somebody lifted my name. Bringing me into his holy presence. Saying what I could not say. Somebody showed me the face of his mercy when darkness was all I could see. Somebody pleaded the blood of Jesus. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me. Amen. Yeah, many of you have prayed for me. I'm so grateful. Good reminder for us to slow down and Think about what God does through the power of prayer. Norman, thank you for that. As we go into our offering moment this morning, I think it's helpful for us to consider the word trust. Uh, My daughter, Drew, many of you know, uh, she uh, is really cute, but she's terrified of bugs irrationally. Um, So much so that if there's a bug and it's dead, she will not cross its path. It must be removed out of the way Uh, It doesn't matter how many times Kayla and I remind her that the bug is no longer living, but is dead, or we squash it with our foot, she still thinks there might be poison or something that is going to get out of the bug onto her and hurt her. Um, And it's a silly example, but um, she lacks trust, right? Many times in our life, it's easy to lack trust. It's easy to be fearful of what what lies ahead. Um, And the lie that persists often in our mind is that God is not worth trusting, but church, he is worth trusting. And one simple way we practice trust every single week is by our regular giving. Um, If you, uh, uh, the ways to give are on the screen, but in our regular giving, we support our local church, but we also support the missions that our church is partnered with around the world. And trust is hard, especially financial trust. But God is worth trusting, and he's a good and comforting God. Uh, This morning, I was reminded by this verse in Jeremiah 17. Uh, It says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. So as we worship the Lord through our giving, let's remember that our trust is ultimately in him. With our time, our talent, and even our finances, we can trust the Lord. Let's pray for our morning offering this morning. Lord, you are worth trusting. You're worth trusting. And so, Lord, as we do this simple act of giving uh, what is rightfully yours back to you, would you help us have deep trust in you? And as we open your word today, would that trust resonate with our hearts so much so that we would live out the gospel with our lives? To your great and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Landry. Well, church, wonderful to be with you this morning, and uh, we are in a study through the year that we are calling The Glory of Jesus Through the Eyes of John, and uh, we've been through the Gospel of John, and, and we picked up the book of Revelation earlier this year, and today we come to Revelation chapter 18, Revelation chapter 18, so I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to that chapter. Uh, we're going to stand and read that in just a minute, but before we do, I want to make a couple of comments First of all, on the subject of the glory of Jesus, I have an exciting announcement to make to us this morning. October the 8th, in just a few weeks, our good friend Peter Williams is going to be back at Council Road Baptist Church. Dr. Peter Williams is the principal of Tyndale House, Cambridge, and he's one of the most brilliant Christian scholars in the world today, one of the strongest uh, voices that we have that defends the, the truths of Christianity, the truths of Scripture, written several books, very well respected, Google his name, uh, he, he is going to be phenomenal, and uh, he's going to be teaching 
on that Sunday morning on the subject of the, the surprising uh, uh, greatness of Jesus. And, uh, and, and that is going to be, I think, a, an amazing Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, he's coming back and he's going to, and he's going to, he's going to talk about the reason that we as Christians can feel strongly about, uh, about our beliefs in, in Christianity and also in the scriptures. And, and then we're going to have a Q&A time. That is going to be an amazing day. October the 8th, wanted to let everyone know about that. And uh, the name of the book actually is The Surprising Genius of Jesus. I knew I got that wrong. But that's coming up in a few weeks. Today we come to uh, Revelation chapter 18. And I, I just want to make a couple of comments about this chapter before we get into it. As we have said over and over again throughout this study of the book of Revelation, the way that we are approaching our teaching of the book of Revelation is to remember that the Bible never says today what it never said in the beginning. And, and therefore, we want to we read the book of Revelation from the perspective, from the context of the way that it was read when the people uh, around the Roman Empire, the Christians around the Roman Empire first read the book the seven churches there in Asia Minor and then the Christians dispersed throughout the Roman Empire would have, would have read this book with a particular understanding of, of what was going on in their own culture, understanding exactly what John was saying to them and then through the work of the Holy Spirit, what he says to us and what he says to Christians all down through time. And keeping that in mind, we know that the Christians of the early centuries were under the boot of the oppressive Roman Empire. They lived in a culture in which this militaristic police state of the Roman Empire uh, affected everyday life, and, and especially to those Jewish, early Jewish believers who had converted to Christianity. Christianity is becoming a threat now to the Roman Empire. Keep in mind that in the Roman Empire of the early centuries, the Romans had a vice grip on every country that they had conquered and therefore now uh, were in possession of and, and were controlling militarily. For instance, uh, as a non-citizen in the Roman Empire, it was Roman law that a Roman soldier at any time could walk up to you and command you to do anything that he wanted you to do. And you were required by law to do whatever that Roman soldier told you to do. So for instance, let's say that you're just going out on a, on a leisurely walk with your family, maybe going to spend the day in nature, enjoying uh, a beautiful day, and a Roman soldier walks up to you as the, as the man of the house and says, hey, you, you're going to carry my bag today. It doesn't matter what kind of plans you might have had. You are now his slave the rest of the day. In effect, every citizen of the Roman, or excuse me, every inhabitant of the Roman Empire who's a non-citizen was a slave to the Romans. And this is the oppressive lifestyle that the early Christians lived. Uh, and, and on top of that, early on in the emergence of Christianity, the Romans tried to stamp it out. And so in some parts of the Roman Empire, some, some provinces of the Roman Empire, you're a Christian, you can't own property. You're a Christian, you can't be a merchant. In other words, you're a Christian, you can't do business. So the persecution of Christians wasn't just in a lion's coliseum, in a coliseum being fed to lions, it was also economic oppression. And this is what the early Christians were suffering under the boot of the militaristic police state uh, in the Roman Empire. And, and it is to that group of people that this letter comes. I, I want you just to just visualize the elderly John the Beloved, who God revealed this vision to, sitting in a cave at Patmos, getting letters, getting information about what's happening in the churches in Asia Meyer, churches that he started, churches that he loved, churches that he poured his life into. And he's getting feedback, he's getting letters, getting reports of how oppressed these people are. And, and how uh, persecuted these people are, how, how the Roman Empire is stamping out Christianity all around the empire. 
And, and these are the reports, these are the letters that he is getting back. And he's sitting there in that cave there at Patmos, feeling despondent, feeling depressed, feeling as if his life's work is being destroyed, when all of a sudden, Jesus comes to him in a vision. And he says, in effect, to John, hey, John, look at this. Let me just peel back the curtain of eternity and show you the way all of this ends. Write this down, John, and send it out to the churches. And that was the context that we have in the book of Revelation. This book, this letter goes out to the churches, and when the people of God read this letter, they understand full well what this letter is saying. And in effect, what it is saying is it may look like evil has a foothold. It may look like the church is being destroyed. It may look like all is lost, but let me tell you, in the end, God wins, and it's not even close. That's the story of the book of Revelation. And as we read this chapter, chapter 18, we're going we're to learn about the, old, about the ancient city of Babylon. Whenever you read Babylon in this passage, and I, I want to say this before we read it, what you need to hear and Abraham brought this up last week, what you need to hear is Rome, okay? That's what you need to hear because the people who are reading it understand that that great prostitute, Babylon, is the city of Rome. And, of course, what does it mean to us? Well, moving forward, as we're going to see in a minute, it means every institution of man, every political system, every stronghold of, of man that stands in opposition to God down through time. It's not just Rome. In the ancient times before this letter was written, it, it was Babylon meant Babylon. Babylon meant uh, every other uh, great city that stood in opposition to God, whether it be in Egypt, whether it be in Assyria, whether it be in Phoenicia, and then moving forward, it's all of the great empires of the world that stood in opposition to God and will one day, in the end times, stand against God and his people. So, with that being said, I'd like for all of us who are able to please stand together for the reading of God's word. This is our tradition each week to read the text in honor of God's word. And this is a long chapter, so don't lock your knees. I don't want anybody passing out as I'm reading this. Okay. <laughs> After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of the, her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven. And God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified as her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys her cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls 
fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of the fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriage, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say, the fruit of you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there even a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city. Where are all uh, who have had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, your heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she has imposed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of, Vi of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters, will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of a bridegroom and bride will never be heard of you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. This is the word of God. Praise be to God for it. What the book of Revelation says to us as Christians is very important. Christianity uh, more than just being a way of life, more than just being our way into a relationship with God and into eternity, is a worldview. It is a way of looking at life. And, and what that worldview says, taught in the book of Revelation, is that there is evil in the world, but evil won't last forever. There is a plan that God has for your life, and he is in control. And we as Christians live with that worldview. It's what informs our sense of hope. It's what informs our sense of joy. This is the reason that Christianity, I think, is set apart from every other worldview in the world, uh, for every other worldview in history. Uh, it is unlike secularism. Secularism says that this is all ending in nothingness. Your life is ending in nothing. I think that that's one of the great dangers of the the. the um, the cultural influence of secular humanism on our own society today. It is, a, it is a depressing worldview. It is a hopeless worldview that everything is moving toward a kind of nothingness, that all of the universe is just going to, to explode in a giant fiery ball. And nothing will be remembered. Nothing that we do in this life will mean anything. That is what separates the Christian worldview from every other secularist worldview. We're also separate from every other, let's say, religious worldview that, that will say that, that, that uh, everyone is moving toward a kind of spiritual paradise. That's not, that also is not what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches that in the end, God is going to renew the heavens and the earth. There will be a new heavens and, the, and, the, and earth. That it was culminated in a glorious victory. And that God is going to redeem and restore the heavens and the earth. And, and that is the glorious future that all of us look forward to. This is the reason that we come together and worship every week and, and, and we can be 
our hearts can be rejoicing in, in that truth as we have sung today in, in, our, uh, in our worship. Um, uh, and, and those great songs lift our spirits because we know that it is, it is what is taught in God's holy word. It, it is what we rely on. It is what we believe that, uh, that because he lives, we have hope for the future. And, uh, and so that, that is the, the lesson, the major lesson of the book of Revelation. I want to make four points about this particular passage. The first point I want to make. I want to point out that God uses metaphors to show us deeper meanings. God uses metaphors to show us deeper meanings. Now, before I, before I move on to that point, let me just make make the observation that in the English language, a metaphor is a description of something without using the words like or as. If you use the words like or as, that's a simile. That's not a metaphor. So it is a description of something without using like or as. So for instance, when you say that person has a heart of stone, that's using a metaphor, right? For all of you who are school teachers, you might say, my classroom is a zoo. That's a metaphor. You might say, that's not a metaphor. That's actually the truth. Well, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the point. You know, it's pointing to a truth using a description, not using like or as. You know, we, uh, songwriters love using metaphors. Um, love is a battlefield is an example of that. Or uh, you ain't nothing but a hound dog uh, <laughs> crying all the time. That's a famous metaphor. And, and, and so, why do people use metaphors? Why does the Bible use metaphors? Why, why do artists use metaphors? Well, the answer to that is for the same reason that we tell stories instead of using uh, uh, lectures, as an example. Because people resonate toward, to the story. We're a visual kind of people. We remember the visual. We remember the story. It's why songs are so important to us, because they get into the heart, right? And, and, and so a metaphor is an important tool in order to demonstrate particular truths. And, and by the way, the Bible uses metaphors all throughout. Jesus himself used metaphors to describe himself. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. That's a metaphor. Uh, Jesus said, um, I am the light of the world. That's a metaphor. Um, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's a metaphor. And, and these metaphors are used to demonstrate particular truths that give deeper meanings. Right? And, and, and all throughout Scripture, we have metaphors, for instance, for the church. The church is described as the bride of Christ. That's a metaphor. The church is a field, the Bible says. That's a metaphor. The church is the body of Christ, hands and feet of Jesus. Those are all metaphors. And, and so when we look through the book of Revelation, what we see is one metaphor after another used to describe deeper truths. This is true of Jesus, and it's true of the church. Jesus is the lion and the lamb. Well, so what does that mean? Well, what a metaphor like that does is it forces you to go deeper in your understanding of who that is. Jesus is a lion and a lamb. Well, in other words, he, he is strong. He, he is the strongest of all. His strength is what gives us life. It's what gives us hope. But he's also a lamb. He's humble. He's sacrificial. So those metaphors cause us to go deeper in our understanding of who he is. We find the descriptions of the church in the book of Revelation as well. The church is a golden lampstand. And, and that brings to mind the purity found in the righteousness of Christ. It brings to mind that we are to be the light of the world. Um, and, and so all of these metaphors have meaning. And metaphors are used throughout the book of Revelation to describe the church, to describe Jesus, to give us a deeper understanding of who that is and what it means. There's also many metaphors that are used to describe a particu particular institution. It's described as the, 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 the seat of Satan, 
the synagogue of Satan, the dragon, the beast. And it is also described in the chapter that we've just read as Babylon. Babylon. It is describing the institutions of man, institutions of humanity that oppose the purposes and the glory of God. All of those human institutions, all of those power structures, all of those strongholds, all of those political systems down through history that have set themselves up against the glory and the purposes of God. It begins with the word Babel in Genesis chapter 3. It's where we get the root for the meaning of the city, the name of the city Babylon. It comes from the word Babel. And of course, we all know Genesis chapter 3, the Tower of Babel was established by men in order to find glory in themselves up against the glory of God. And so Babel then becomes, becomes code for any institution, any power, any attempt by man to set themselves apart from God to gain glory for themselves and to oppose the purposes of God. Babel becomes Babylon, and Babylon, of course, represents that very thing. We see this all throughout, all throughout Scripture. So Babylon, when you, when you read Babylon... In this context, what you, should, what you should be thinking is, first of all, Roman Empire. That's who they were writing to. That's who John was writing to. That's how they would have understood it in their day. But not just Rome, but every political system, every institution of man that opposes the work of God. Okay? So that's point number, two, number one. Point number two. Point number two, Babylon represents powers and institutions of humankind that stand against the purposes of God. Babel becomes code for any institution, any power of man, any stronghold that opposes the work of God in our lives. Now, now that I've said that, now that I've made that point, are, are your wheels turning a little bit about what that might be in our day? I mean, can you think of institutions of man, strongholds of humanity, culture, society, that very obviously are standing in opposition to the glory of God, the work of God, the purposes of God? I mean, I, I think it doesn't take a whole lot of Digging, thinking to see that those institutions, those powers are in existence today. In other words, what I want all of us to understand is that we are living right now in the age of Babylon. We are right now living in the age of Babylon. And, and, and God's people need to be aware of that, need to have an understanding of that. That's point number two. Point number three. The spirit of Babylon is alive today. And it is moving toward eternal self-destruction. I want you to see again verse number seven. Verse number seven says this. This is, this is about Babylon. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen, I am not a widow. I will never mourn. What is that? That's a boast. That's a boast. That's, that's a beating of the chest. I will never mourn. Look at me. Look at how great I am. Look at what I have become. I, I will never be destroyed. It reminds me, by the way, of a statement that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, makes in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 29 and 30. Here's what, here's what we read about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar says, 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. By, by the way, 
you, you remember Babylon, don't you? Babylon is where the Christians were taken into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, which in August in Oklahoma, all of us can relate to the fiery furnace, can't we? I mean, this week, I, I, walk, I walked outside and I thought, my goodness, I feel like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right now. That's Babylon. That's that, that great city, and, and, and it was a beautiful city. It was an amazing city. It's a city built like Rome on, on, on power and exploitation, slavery. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says, verse seven, uh, chapter 4, verses 29 through 30, he said, Is this not great Babylon that I have built as a royal residence? By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. That's a boast. And, and that is the spirit of Babylon. Okay. So, and by the way, in the book of Revelation, we see that the, 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 the beast... Uh, what was aligned with the dragon. In other words, it was Satan himself, it was the enemy that was producing this spirit. And, 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 and that is what happens today. The spirit of the enemy is what leads us into this boast. Look at me. Look at how great I am. Look at what I have done. Look at what I have built. Look, look, look what... What I have accomplished. I remember years ago, I heard the story of a pastor who went to, went to see a local rancher. The rancher showed him around his beautiful ranch, and at the end of the day, the pastor looks at this rancher, and he says, it, he's, he's trying to witness, trying to share the gospel with this, with this very wealthy, very powerful rancher. He says to him, my goodness, as you look around your property, you must, you must be amazed at the beauty of God's nature. You know, he's trying to, to get there with the gospel. And the rancher looks at the pastor and he says, yeah, well, you should have seen it when only God had it. Okay. That's a boast. Look at me. Look at what I've done. You know, this is, this is the, I, I, you know, when I'm thinking, of this, this week I was kind of thinking about the spirit of Babylon that is so prevalent in our world today and in the, in, the, in the social media culture that we live in where everybody kind of beats their chest and, and wants to show how great they are, you know. And, and one of the images I had in my mind was whatever sports team, you know, when a guy scores a touchdown or scores a goal or makes a, makes a goal in soccer and they, they run up to the crowd and they start beating their chest or they start holding their jersey like, I did that, I did that. I, look at me, look at what I did. It's all me. We, we, we see it in sports because it's so visible, but it's in every one of our hearts. It's in us. It's in our nature. It's the enemy's influence on our lives. Look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at the kingdom that I have built. It's the spirit of Babylon. Anything that causes us to choose something besides Jesus will destroy us. And that's the spirit of Babylon. The world craves power. The world craves wealth. The world craves Control. And it's all around us. The world will do anything to gain more power, to gain more control, to gain more wealth. And, and the reason is because we're in the world. And, and that dark nature is in all of us. I, I remember... Years ago, reading the autobiography of Charles Colson. Charles Colson was 
the chief counsel for Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal and ended up spending his time in prison because of that. Later became a Christian, became a Christian in prison. And, and in his autobiography, he writes about the incredible uh, lust for power. And he, and he reflected on, on how power, the, the desire for power is very alluring. He, and he says it, it's, it's even more alluring than wealth. He said, once you've gained power, you just want more of it. And he said, you, 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 you inevitably begin to believe that you are uh, indestructible when you have a lot of power. And, and then he went on to say that the only way to control this need for power is to submit yourself to a higher authority. That's what he came to understand. A brilliant man. He came to understand that the, the desire for power destroyed him. And that his only hope was to submit to a higher authority. It's what led him to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look again at this passage. Look at what happens in, in this passage, verse 11. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys her cargoes anymore. And then verse 12, cargoes of gold, silver, and, and, and by the way, church, what we have here in verses 12 and 13 is the longest list of any book in antiquity of the merchandise that was sold in ancient Rome. Very interesting. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stone, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood. That's a scented wood. I don't really know what that is. Potpourri, maybe? I don't know. So far, it sounds like Branson, doesn't it? <laughs> Articles of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, mirth, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriage, carriages. And human beings sold as slaves. Rome was a great power. Rome was a city of decadence, a city of incredible wealth, but it was built on the backs of slaves. And, and by the way, there are a lot of historians who believe that the reason the Roman Empire fell was because it was an economy built on slavery. And, and when, they, when they conquered, when they had conquered all of the places they could conquer in the world, their commodity of human slavery ran out. And it wasn't long before one generation after another began to collapse. And that's what the book of Revelation says is going to happen. It says that it is going to be destroyed. Then the, verse 21, the mighty, mighty angel picked up a boulder, threw it, this giant boulder, into the sea and said, with that kind of violence, the great city of Babylon is going to fall. It will be destroyed. And all of the musicians and the harpists will never play again. No worker of any trade will ever be found again. The sound of millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of the lamp will never shine again. Babylon will be destroyed. When did John write this book? He wrote it 60, 70 AD, let's say. 429 AD. Rome fell. On the night of August 24th, 410, rebel slaves, a suborned official, or some other unknown party, quietly opened the gates of Rome to let in the Visigoths. And it was utterly destroyed. Church, let, it, let me just remind us. Never lay your hope. Never lay your sense of identity. 
Never lay your sense of joy at the feet of the state. It will destroy you. I contrast what we find in Babylon to what the book of Revelation says about that great city, Jerusalem. You see, the city of Babylon is set up against that great city of Jerusalem, that city of God, where his righteousness and holiness prevails for all of eternity. In chapter 21, it says in verse 23, the city that does not need the sun or the moon or the, or the stars to shine upon it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is that lamp. That's where your hope is. That's where you lay your sense of identity. That's where you lay your sense of joy, your sense of expectation, not at the city of Babylon, but the city of God. Which leads me to point number four, and that is that as Christians, we are to separate ourselves from the spirit of Babylon. Do you see what God says in the book of Revelation? God's people... Come out of her. Resist her. We are to resist the spirit of Babylon. Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 comes to mind. He said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. What God says to us is we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That we are to be in Babylon, but not of Babylon. Jesus taught a parable in Mark chapter 4 where he said the parable of the seed and the soil. And he said, still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word, but the word But the worries of this life, listen to this, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things came in and choked the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, produce a crop, uh, some 30, some 60, some 100 times that was sown. What Jesus is saying is, be careful what influences you. We can be caught up in the spirit of Babylon and God's word is choked out of us. That's the lesson for today. That we are to be in Babylon but not of Babylon. That we are to be careful not to be influenced by the spirit of Babylon but that we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, how we thank you for your word We thank you that your word teaches us that even though things look as if evil is getting the upper hand, that in truth, in the end, you win. That we are to be people who focus our hearts and our eyes on you, trusting you, believing in you, walking with you, knowing your word, studying your word, loving your word. How we love you, Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Church family, would you stand with me? We're going to sing for a few minutes here. This is a time for prayer. Maybe you would like to come and pray with one of our pastors, one of our ministers. Uh, Maybe you'd like to come and light a candle. These candles, by the way, are just a way to express a prayer in this community. In this time of worship, you're saying to the rest of us, I'm praying a prayer now that is important and meaningful to me. And and we always encourage to, to use that acronym of the word pray. A praise prayer, a repentance prayer, an ask prayer, or maybe a yield prayer. And and we will join with you as you light that candle, not knowing exactly what you're praying for, but knowing that. We as your family will pray with you and hold you up. Maybe you'd like to light a candle today.
As we sing, we invite you to come. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can a peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee, every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tell voice like thine can a peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come going to stay in an attitude of prayer, so you pray as long as you need, but Rick, I want to thank you for that word. Our worldview, it teaches us God wins and evil will not have the last word. Thank you for that. Um, Babylon will fall. Let's put our trust in Christ while there's still time. I want to remind you really quickly, Wiz Kids training, if you volunteer for Wiz Kids, will be after the 1030 service. Just want to give you that reminder. Also, next Sunday is Groups Month, so come back next Sunday. It's going to be an exciting month, and then at the end of Groups Month, we're going to do two big things. We're going to have baptism on that Sunday here in the room, so if you're a follower of Jesus, follow him in baptism. So grab that card in front of you, circle B for baptism, and we'll follow up. Also, the day before that Sunday on September 23rd, we'll have an event called Share the Harvest. It'll be at the Cube. You'll hear more information about that, okay? So let me pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you that our hope is built on Jesus. Father, thank you that you've already written the end. We see that Babylon will fall in your city, for your people will stand for all eternity. May we leave here filled with hope that we have an eternity to be with you and our loved ones that have trusted in you as well. Thank you for your word that encourages us. In Jesus' name, amen.